Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for joining us. My name is Ashley Mangum, and I will be facilitating today's webinar. I'm just going to give a couple more minutes and allow people to log in today's uh, webinar, and we will go ahead and get started. Thank you again for joining us. All right, well, we will go ahead and get started. Again, my name is Ashley Mangum and I am the project manager for Kids Mental Health Pierce County. And I wanna thank you all for joining us for our March webinar today. And if you're not familiar with Kids Mental Health Pierce County, we are a community collaborative that is aimed at streamlining and coordinating behavioral health services for school age kids here in Pierce County. And so we really have been working on developing a coordinated responsive behavioral health system that serves the needs of children, youth and families at the right time, in the best place, and with the best outcome for every family. Since the onset of the pandemic, Kids Mental Health Pierce County has hosted a series of virtual webinars with the goal of providing supports and resources to parents and caregivers and to help understand and support kids and families during the pandemic. Today's webinar features two of my amazing colleagues, Lisa Duke and Darren Wentz from the Mary Bridge Center for Grieving Children with a focus on helping children and youth cope with grief and loss. As always, a second goal for today is to provide a form of community support where we can learn from each other. So we have the opportunity for questions and answers. You can use the question and answer tab below, and you can also utilize the chat box as well. Um, feel free to use that chat box to share your own suggestions as well, and we will do our best to answer them if we're able. And if we're not able, we hope to follow up with you after today's webinar. Um, just as a reminder, today's meeting is being recorded. And we will post this recording to the Kids Mental Health Pierce County website, as well as send out an email after today's presentations. So before um, I turn it over to my wonderful colleagues, I want to go over some community agreements for today. Community agreements help members work together in a way that honors each other. And when inevitable challenges emerge, help us to return to a sense of an aligned purpose. So for today's webinar, I ask that we recognize we recognize that we must strive to overcome historical and divisive biases, such as racism and sexism in our society. We acknowledge that we are all systemically taught misinformation about our own groups and members of other groups. This is true of everyone, regardless of our groups. No blame. We agree not to blame ourselves or others for the misinformation we have learned, but to accept responsibility for not repeating misinformation after we have learned otherwise. We agree to listen respectfully to each other without interruptions. We acknowledge that we may be at different stages of learning on the content and discussion topics. We agree that no one should be required or expected to speak for their whole race or gender. We can't even if we wanted to. Everyone has come to the table to learn, grow, and share. We will trust that people are doing the best they can. We acknowledge once again that we may be at different stages of learning on the topic. I am not an expert. I'm here to facilitate the process. I and everyone in this group are here to learn. And just remember intent versus impact. We may have the intent not to do harm, but some groups or individuals may be impacted. And some groups may be impacted from us bringing up historical oppressions. So with those community agreements, I now have the honor of introducing two of my wonderful colleagues. And I'm gonna start first by introducing Lisa Duke. Lisa Duke is a MSW or a master's in social work from the Bridges Center for Grieving Children. Lisa has been fortunate to work in that role of family support coordinator with the families at Bridges since 2012. Working with grief and loss has challenged and enriched her life. After re receiving her master's in social work at New York University, she worked for several years in the pediatric community mental health in the South Bronx. She is grateful for the Tacoma community on this journey that she shares with her husband, Paul Duke, and two amazing daughters, Rachel and Savannah. Next, I get to introduce Darren Wentz, and he is a licensed clinical social worker who joined the Bridges staff at, as the Bridges program coordinator in July 2007. Prior to joining Bridges, Darren served as executive director of Families Unlimited Network, a nonprofit agency serving low-income children and families. His work experience includes over 25 years of work with children, including teaching junior high students, directing an after-school program for children ages 9 to 13, 
and counseling children, teens, and families in private practice work. Darren received his MSW from the University of Washington, Tacoma. While in the social work program, he served as an intern at Bridges during the 2004 to 2005 school year. Darren received a certification in, I'm going to not say this right, <laughs> through, do you want to get help? Certificate of Thanatology. <laughs> I was not going to get that. <laughs> it's a tongue twister. Oh, through ADEC in 2009 and became a licensed independent clinical social worker in 2011. For over 10 years, Darren has coordinated Camp Aaron, Pierce County. Darren and his wife, Pam, have three children, Caleb, Ryan, and Lewis. So again, thank you so much, Derek and Lisa, Darren and Lisa, for being here today and providing this training. And I am going to hand it over to you. Great. Thanks, Ashley. Thanks for the introductions. It's great to be with all of you this afternoon for this webinar. As Ashley introduced us, my name is Darren, and I work at Bridges with my coworker here, Lisa. And we are going to talk a little bit with you today about how to best help children and youth cope with grief and loss. Um, most of you hopefully have heard of Bridges before. We've been around for 32 years uh, serving children and families when they have experienced uh, significant loss or have somebody in their family with a significant illness. So that's what Bridges has been providing the community for a long time. And we're very proud of that. Uh, we know that um, our, our job is important, certainly, because we know loss happens, unfortunately, to children. And we have been honored to be a part of the journey as they continue to heal with their entire family. So we are gonna spend the next roughly hour with all of you, giving a chance to think a little more about how we can best support children, teens, and their families as they grieve. Go ahead and go to the next slide, Ashley. The mission at Bridges is that no child will grieve alone. And we know that at Bridges, the work that we do directly here is certainly very important, but we don't see every child who's grieving in Pierce County or in Hall of Washington, certainly. Uh, so we do all we can to help other people feel uh, a little more comfortable and a little more equipped to address the needs of children and teens as they grieve. And certainly as we think about the pandemic that we've been living through, loss has been a part of probably all of our lives in some capacity. Hopefully we all haven't experienced death during this time, but certainly we've all experienced loss of some capacity. And I'm guessing you come today probably rep representing some children or teens that have experienced loss. So I was gonna encourage you to start our webinar just to give us a sense of kind of where you're coming from, um, to go ahead and put in the chat what type of losses you know your children, teens that you're working with are experiencing. And we'll just take a second to view those as you type those into the chat. So go ahead and do that now. So I see parent and parent relatives who've died. Yep. Death of grandparents, suicides, aunts, grandmas, removal of the parents. Yes, loss of routine, family separation, peers. Loss of time spent with family. Yep, loss of friendship, social connections. Yep, loss of social interaction, that's for sure. Yep, not being able to go to school, loss of social interaction there. Yeah, thanks everybody. Go ahead and keep putting those in there. Um, and we are gonna try to incorporate not just talking about grief when it comes to death, but loss in general as well, because even though loss is a significant, or a death is a significant loss, there are other losses that sometimes get lost in the process, and those do need to be grieved as well. So that's really important for us to do during our time together. So thank you for continuing to write down our, uh, some of those losses in the chat. Um, I'm gonna hand it over to, to Lisa now and she's gonna go through a little bit of um, some of the terminology that we wanna make sure we're all comfortable with. Yeah. So Ashley, you can go, the next slide is, is just our info. You all will receive this um, PowerPoint and then you'll have that to be able to contact us for any further um, follow-up or resources or support. But that's why we're here. So we're gonna talk about defining grief, just to give the terminology um, that we will, we will use these terms throughout the presentation. So just um, to talk about them a little bit, um, Bereavement, and we all have all heard that word bereavement, and it's the state of being, whether it's emotional, cognitive, spiritual, or all of those, um, and it's the being that's caused by a loss, such as a death, um, and as Darren just mentioned, many kinds of loss can bring a state of bereavement for the individual and family, 
And then grief is the intense process of thoughts, feelings, and behaviors that are caused by that loss. And then mourning is very important. And that's the, the culturally patterned expression of the person in the family of those thoughts, feelings, and behaviors. So um, we will talk more about ways of mourning and the importance of mourning in the midst of that grief process. So you can go on to the next slide, Ashley. So as we just as I just mentioned, that grief is is what you think and feel on the inside when you experience the death or the loss in normal life. And then the mourning is that expression of those thoughts and feelings. And that can be really important for children and teens and even adults too. But to to sift that out for them, that's often what we will talk about the very first time that we meet them. Um, in our virtual intake, or you know, hopefully at some point we'll be back to in-person intakes. But um, it's just defining that for them that what this big, what that grieving word means, and that those thoughts and feelings that they're having inside. And a lot of the work that we will do with the children and teens is really helping them to put words to what those thoughts and feelings are, and finding ways to express them collectively in that community with others, and then defining what mourning the what meaning they can have around the morning and, and, and um, holding on to that person or, or holding on to the memories they had of how life was before. Um, one of the experts that we really value in the work that we do is Alan Wolfelt. He has done a lot of, um, there's a lot of writings and a lot of support materials that he has put together for families. Um, and we, we really appreciate what he says about the importance of mourning, that everyone experiences grief and grief is a universal experience for all of us. And that, that when we have a major loss, we all experience grief, but it's only those who are able to find the ways to mourn really are able to heal and move on and find that movement in their life and to love fully again, hopefully. So that's, that's, kind of the context and the basis of what we do and how we define grief and looking at it. So Darren's gonna talk a little bit about some of the research. Yeah, just a very brief overview of some grief theories. I'm guessing if I ask for people to raise their hand, most of you probably have heard of the stages of grief. It has been something that has permeated our culture over the last 30 to 40 years since it was first introduced by Elizabeth Kubler-Ross. Um, some of you may even be able to identify the different stages shock or denial, bargaining, anger, depression, and acceptance. Um, you see it all the time in movies, TV. Um, and in some ways that's unfortunate. Um, the stages of grief certainly were pioneering work that Elizabeth Kubler-Ross did. Um, they, uh, they pertained more to the illness experience than they did to grief experience when she first created them. But because our culture, particularly probably our white American culture is what it is, and we really like the thought of getting through a stage and moving on to the next stage and kind of checking boxes and kind of going through this very, very linear process, which Kubler-Ross didn't mean to, but that's kind of what it has been interpreted into that you go through each stage. And once you're done with it, you're done with it and you move on to the next stage. And once you get to acceptance, you're done grieving. Um, what we don't like about the stages, of course, is that it isn't really setting up folks that are grieving. And some of you probably can relate to this because I'm guessing some of you have grief significant losses. Um, it doesn't necessarily fit the actual experience that the experience tends to be much more fluid. You kind of go back and forth between a variety of different stages, if you want to call it that, or a bar, we could use a variety of different words. Because really, if you looked at all the different grief theories, uh, we could spend hours on that. But I wanted to bring up Kubler-Ross just because of the, the way it's permeated our culture. And then of course, how sometimes it does set up folks for a, a, a disconnect between what they read about and then what they experience. Uh, but a couple other Greek theories that, that we tend to like, um, our dual process is a, a newer Greek theory. And this just highlights the two different types of work that are done when we're grieving. There is the loss oriented work that pertains to all that we need to kind of think about, feel, and all that's been lost with a death or whatever loss experience we're going through. Um, and then there's the other side of the pendulum swing. So if one pendulum swing is the loss orientation, the other side is the restoration 
side of the, the swinging pendulum. And that's more of the, what life looks like moving forward. How have I been impacted by this loss? So if you take COVID, for example, we've all had to kind of do a lot of work around losing things, whether that's vacations, social interactions, um, a job change, you know, job is feeling different, lots of different losses that we've gone through. And then there's a the restoration part of like, okay, this pandemic isn't gonna be over in a week. Like what's gonna happen moving forward? And even as we move through the end of the pandemic, what is life gonna look like? Knowing it may not go right back to normal like it was in February of 2020, it may look different. And knowing that that's kind of where we're at with COVID and that's kind of the swinging pendulum that the dual process identifies. The other theory is kind of what we use at Bridges for our curriculum when we work with children and families. And that is a work of William Warden uh, from the uh, early eighties, kind of when childhood bereavement was first being identified. Uh, prior to that, they really didn't think kids grieved because uh, kids did so much play and just seemed to be um, oblivious sometimes to some of those harder emotions or we show them in very short bursts that we'll talk about in a minute. Uh, but you can go to the next slide, Ashley, because I believe those four tasks are there on a slide for you. So accepting the reality of the loss, just acknowledging what has been lost, uh, processing the pain of grief, then adjusting to the world without the person that's there any longer, and then finding the enduring connection with the person while embarking on a new life. So you can see the dual process we talked about and the tasks, there is some similarity, of course, um, but we like the task because it does show that there is work involved in grief, um, that it is intentional work in some ways, and there are some specific things that can be helpful for people um, as young as four or even younger. Um, a quote I love is that a child who's old enough to love is old enough to grieve. So. Um, even though Bridges just serves children from four to 18, we know that kids younger than that will certainly go have their own grief experience. So those are the four tasks of Warden and kind of a quick overview on some of the different theories. Great, yeah. And so um, as mentioned earlier, that grief is a universal experience for all of us. Um, we, it, we find it important to distinguish between a little bit between the normal grief and the complicated grief. Um, because that, that comes up a lot and um, some of the, it, we will be asked a lot by families, is this normal? Is this intensity of feeling normal? Is this unpredictable experience of being blindsided by the, the grief feelings or thoughts? Um, is that normal? And they are. So um, it's normal that the person is impacted on all domains of the emotional, physical, social, psychological, and spiritual levels. Um, it is normal that it's isolating for families and individuals. Again, that it is overwhelming at times due the, to the inten intensity, the duration, and the unpredictability of the grief. And it is normal that it causes secondary losses for the family. So it may be the loss of a home. It may be loss of an income. It may be the loss of the person who took care of certain tasks for the child in their life. And now... At times, it may be their primary concern is who's going to help them with those tasks, um, that they may not even be able to get to putting words to the, the loss of the person. But so who's putting me to bed? Who's, um, who's making my meals? Who's taking me to school? Some of those things that are, that are really crucial and really important for those children to get back to everyday life. So that's normal with grief. And then on the next slide, we talk about what can complicate um, and all of you have seen examples of this in your work and just that um, the the lack of knowledge about the grief in particular the lack of knowledge about the death and how the death happened or some of the even telling about the death um, we see this more so with families where there a person has died by suicide that they may not really want to share that with the child and so that can really complicate for that child expressing the feelings of grief and, um, and expressing their thoughts around their grief. The, so the factors of how the death occurred um, can really complicate the grief for the individual or the families. The relationship that the person had with the person who died or that they is no longer in their life um, can make it difficult if it was, conflictual, if it was um, the relationship was impacted by, by addiction, um, 
or domestic violence that can make the grief really difficult and to to express those feelings and those thoughts um, at times for some kids and teens there's a feeling of relief and there might be some real guilt at those feelings as well so um, that can make it more difficult for them and then if, it, if it's this family system that they really don't have the open family to to express their feelings or their thoughts, um, that can make it, it difficult then to express that. So um, it can really impact the individual's ability to adjust and to mourn. Um, so those are some of the things, and we'll get into more as we talk about kids in development to what can what can show up in those in those ages. So. We can, so now we can go off slide for, um, sharing and yeah, thanks Ashley. And maybe we can pause there too, as we go off slide. Um, I don't know if there's any questions, but we always want uh, feedback. So if anything we said right now brings up a comment or a question, we'd love to hear that from you. I know Ashley's uh, monitoring that. So I'll just give a moment to check in with Ashley. Anything showing up right now with questions, Ashley? Yeah, there was one question in the chat box um, right. from Vanessa. She's curious if there are activities or resources for group sessions that you could share. Yes, absolutely. Um, we won't do that today in the webinar, but we'd be happy to uh, email that to you, give you some ideas around uh, some activities that you can do both virtually, uh, as we've learned over the course of this last year, and then of course, once you're in person with a child or a group of children or teens. Yeah, absolutely. And I do see a hand raise. If you could utilize the chat or Q&A box, um, that would allow us to, to get to your question. Or I could, I could allow participants to talk if that's helpful, Darren and Lisa. Yeah, um, let's do chat for now, Okay. Ashley. And then maybe at the end when we have the Q&A, we can open up for folks to verbally ask questions. Sounds great. So Candice, we'll get to you during Q&A, but if you want to utilize that chat box or the Q&A box for any questions, um, we'll make sure to, to get those asked. All right. Should we keep going then? Yeah. Great. All right. So we're going to spend the bulk of the remainder of our time talking about grief and what that looks like across the developmental age groups. Um, so Lisa and I will just have a bit of a conversation uh, talking about how different age groups may be processing loss. Uh, and we know children of all ages, like I mentioned just earlier, are old enough to form attachments. So once those attachments are formed, then if that attachment is broken, then we know there's going to be grief related to that as well. So we see that with certainly with people. Uh, we see that with animals um, for children. Even we, we even see that with, with objects at times. So it's important that we recognize those losses um, and certainly try to understand where children are at, at their different age groups. So I'm gonna start with six-year-olds and this can probably be adjusted down to even as young as four to six-year-olds. Um, but four to six-year-olds may not see certainly a death or a, even a loss of some kind as, uh, they might see it as reversible. So they may not understand the concreteness of the death. Um, so they may still ask questions about, is that person coming back? Where did they go? Um, can I go visit them? Um, this is where it can be really important to use the word death and dying. Um, we have a lot of uh, euphemisms in our language that can be very confusing for children. So for example, saying the person, we lost that person, you know, a little four to six year old may feel like, well, maybe there's playing a game hide and seek and maybe I can go find them somewhere. Um, or, you know, they went on a trip or they passed away, um, even can be somewhat confusing because they tend to be pretty concrete in their thinking. And so it can be uncomfortable for adults to use words like death and dying. Um, but we know that's really helpful because it does give a little uh, or a lot more specificity to what's going on because hopefully a child has some understanding of what happens when bugs die or whatever their context be, but just that death and dying language has a lot more meaning to it than some of the euphemisms that we might use. Um, children in this age group tend to utilize magical thinking, which is part of being four to six is having imagination, right? And being able to pretend and play with little action figures and do all kinds of things that we have a, as adults really struggle with. Um, but that magical thinking can sometimes be a, a hard thing for children 
particularly if they aren't given information about a loss. Um, so specifically when we're talking about death, you know, if a child doesn't know how the person died, um, they may make that magical thinking um, be about them, which is very common too for four to six year olds to be kind of egocentric. They don't have the bigger picture of the world. So it's not like they're selfish, but that's kind of all they can picture is their own uh, influence on the world. So they may think something they said, something they did um, caused that person to die or get sick um, or to just to, if they were sent away or something, you know, all those things, um, little four to six year olds can sometimes um, imagine that they have caused whatever this loss situation is. So that's where we really try to advocate for children to be told the truth. Um, doesn't necessarily mean they need to know all the details, but enough of the truth, uh, particularly what they're asking for, so that they're not going to go down that road as far as maybe we fear they would, thinking that they maybe caused something to happen. Um, so another thing very common in four to six year olds is regression. So just um, having trouble sleeping, um, even toilet training issues are common, reverting to talking more like a three, two year old baby um, might talk um, are some common things we might see in, in this age group when they're going through grief. And then what can be helpful is symbolic play because they don't have language like we do as adults and certainly as children get older. So if they don't have the words, they need some way to express what they're going through. So giving them tools, implements, different ways to express um, yeah, what, what's going on inside of them. It does remind me of a, a child that I worked with really early on when they first came to Bridges and it was pretty early on in my time at, at Bridges. He was able to talk a little bit about um, what he was going through and he talked about liking to go out to the trampoline and jumping as high as he possibly can on this trampoline and I said oh you, how high do you go and he's like oh I go high enough to go into the clouds so I'm using that you know his imagination I said oh that's pretty high what, what do you see up there in the clouds and he said oh, I see my mom up there and his mom had, had recently died and really well what do you what, what's your mom doing up there and she, she's making um, she's making pancakes oh pancakes really <laughs> and pancakes happen to be one of his favorite foods that his mom made and again it was just his way of using his imagination to express trying to figure out where his mom was and what that relationship was going to look like or at least you know some um, frame for where his mom was now so that's again a little bit of an example of symbolic play for children you know? hanging on it's, it strikes me that he's hanging on to something meaningful right in that and relationship that memory, right? yeah mm -hmm. exactly and yep. Darren and Lisa, there was a question that came up while you were explaining that. And asked, right. Would that also apply if a family member dies by suicide? And if you had any ideas on how that could be explained to a young kiddo? Absolutely. Yeah, that's a common question that we get um, phone calls about all the time. Um, and, you know, some of the wording we put on that is, well, first of all, um, for the adult, recognizing it can be really hard to tell any child or teen that or somebody you've cared about has died by suicide. So recognizing it's not easy, um, but knowing that in the long run, they will do better knowing that they can trust you. So whoever that person is, that's going to be sharing it. You want that to be a person the child trusts and to know that that will be a continuing part of their relationship, knowing they can trust you to tell them even the hardest news. Um, now, of course, with four to six year olds, you're not gonna tell them all the details, but some wording around that is certainly sometimes four to six year olds understand, you know, just like our bodies get sick, um, sometimes our heads also and our brains get sick and cause us to do things that we would never do if we didn't have some kind of illness in our brain. Um, and so putting that kind of language on it, that's, that's what happened to whoever you cared about is that they had this illness in their brain and it made them do something that they would never do if they were, were healthy in that way. So. Uh, so that that begins the conversation and knowing that it is a conversation that will continue um, and recognizing that will continue throughout the child's life, perhaps they may continue to have questions as they get older, um, but that at least begins that conversation and creates this hopefully trusting safe relationship for that child to continue to ask those questions to process and to try to make sense of what really doesn't make sense for, for any of us when suicide happens. And also, I mean, it will continue if, if that really, if that conversation is happening um, repeatedly, hopefully, 
um, but also as we often tell adults who um, as, as gently as we can, but that children will often make up their own reasons for how the death occurred because they're trying to make sense of it. We all are when we have these traumatic experiences and children will often come up with an answer that has to do with their themselves being to blame for the death. And, you know, of course, that is the last thing that the, the caring adults in their life want them to believe. And so this can help them to, to hopefully not do that as well. So, and we'd be happy to share with you again, an email to Ashley, or you got our email address too, to send to us. Um, we have like 10 talking points and explaining losses to children and suicide is one of those specific ones that, um, again, 10 points is, you know, it's not something that's easy, even having those 10 ideas, but at least gives families some type of framework and some encouragement and some support as they go about thinking about having that conversation that can be so difficult. And sometimes in group, that's what the adults will help each other with is that they they're at different stages at that. We have a, a, an adult group just for families where there's been a suicide. And oftentimes in that adult group, it will be a, a discussion about how that went and what they did and just really supporting each other in that process. So good question. Yeah. Anything else, Ashley? No other um, questions, just a comment um, in terms of just talking about suicide and maybe um, if, if that is a future topic to maybe offer a trigger warning or, or something just to prepare participants as we continue to navigate these conversations. Yeah. Okay, yeah, yeah. Um, and it, I would just say with the six-year-old, four six-year-olds, that can be a stage where we see the parents question, are they really grieving? And because that play is so important mm -hmm. and we find that the kids will have a short attention span to grief um, and they'll flip back and forth pretty easily. Yep. And so um, sometimes parents will say, I'm not so sure they're grieving. And so we're just sometimes helping them to see that they are, it's just the age that they're at and yep. the development. Yep. So. The next age that we're talking about is the seven to nine. And this is when they're beginning to develop more of a cognitive um, understanding of cause and effect. And so this is often an age where they may begin to understand more about the details that they've been told already if the death occurred when they were younger or the loss happened when they were younger. They really, they may be able to understand, begin to understand it better at this age. Um, and, and so that can be really important because the finality of death is just really difficult to understand at a younger age. Um, also with that, that cognitive development can be some real concrete thinking and often very direct and factual retelling of the, of the events in their life. And so sometimes in a family where there is maybe a seven or eight year old in the family and there's teens or there, you know, then the, the adults in their life, um, that seven or eight year old might be very verbal with strangers about what the family is going through where the teen wants to be very private and the adult wants to be private. And so that, that can be difficult for the family to kind of maneuver through that. But that's really normal at this age to be more direct and factual in retelling. Um, very curious often at this age, they may be more curious about the body and what happens to the body. Um, and asking details about that, which is very normal. Throughout all of the developmental stages, we can see the somatic symptoms and of course in adults as well, but um, they can really show up in, in this age. And some of the interventions at this age is we will focus um, possibly more on their physical experiences and then help them to connect those physical experiences to possibly then thoughts and feelings that would be connected to those. So a stomach ache, a headache, um, wanting to be really, wanting to be aggressive um, or have ag aggressive impulses, um, that would maybe be more of a, a the way to get at the grief, um, mm -hmm. thoughts and feelings. So um, anything else you'd add? To no, I think that's good. Yeah. yeah, yep. Good, I'm gonna keep moving us because I'm mindful of our time a bit. Mm -hmm. uh, so 10 to 12 is where we're going next. So 10 to 12 year olds, um, they, they have a pretty good understanding that death is normal, um, that it happens, it's universal, so it happens to all of us eventually. Uh, and they also understand it's unpredictable, uh, given what 
if a child has experienced the death of somebody they were close with, it often can be unpredictable. Uh, and at this age, they're also very aware of peers. So they do a lot of comparing, um, you know, who's smarter, who's better at sports, who's a better speller, who's better musically. Uh, they're becoming very aware of just how they compare with their peers. Um, so it also impacts how they compare themselves to others and what their families are like. So, you know, kids that have experienced divorce, they're very aware of like how my living situation may be different than other people and other friends that I know. If they've experienced the death of a parent, it can be very uh, a different experience, particularly come Mother's Day, Father's Day, or anytime um, that conversation may come up that highlights the fact that they don't have a mom or dad who's in their life. Uh, uh, we hear about probably mo most often in this age group with bullying um, because that comparison is such a big deal um, that can have a, a dark side to it where kids bully each other because of differences that they like to pick on and bring out. Um, so there's a very real question of just how much to share um, with even friends. Um, going back to school after a loss has happened can be very difficult for kids because they don't know how much do they know, how much do I share, do I want to feel awkward? Um, most kids don't, of course. So just really wrestling with how much and who to trust in the midst of all that they're trying to figure out. Um, it's also a place where there's spiritual beliefs that are becoming a little more concrete. Uh, so recognizing that for this age group is important and, and wrestling with that idea of, of where does that person go or where do people go when they die? It's really important as we look at interventions for this age group um, to normalize and to validate, uh, to let them know that there are other people their age who have gone through this, um, who are going through it. Um, so that's where a group like what we offer at Bridges can be really helpful is just they know that they're not alone in what they're going through. But because they may not want to talk about it directly sometimes, games and activities can help promote some of the sharing that can be easier more easily done uh, in the context of a game rather than just questions being asked to them. Um, even bringing up stories that involve death and grief. Um, obviously, it's a, it's a huge topic in our culture with movies and books, TV shows. So even finding creative ways to engage in that, even um, music as well incorporates uh, some grief and loss issues. So finding creative ways to bring that into group can be really helpful for, for children in this age group. Great, yeah, and so now we're, we will move into teens, which is 13 to 19, really broad scope of change, right? So, um, so much is happening at this age um, and they are beginning that earlier and they're beginning to think about separating and then of course continue on in defining who they are. Um, and so you throw in a death or a significant loss in their life that's really challenging to that definition and that um, coming to terms with figuring out how they fit in the world, where they belong, what's fair, what's, you know, how to find justice, how to make sense of the world around them. And they're really seeking to do that. But with that significant loss, that can be really challenging to them to do that. They are seeking to have some mastery and control. Um, their, their sense of self-image can, um, be fragile um, and they can be reluctant to open up what some of what we find when we first meet teens at Bridges is they can be some of the ones that are most reluctant to, to be a part of the groups. Um, we encourage them to give groups three tries to just test it out for themselves and see if they might find a fit there um, with the reminder that they won't be they won't be asked to answer questions like Darren was just saying but they hope they will be encouraged to engage with peers um, who have a similar story, um, but they can be pretty reluctant to open up because of that being self-conscious, that comparison as Darren was talking about. Um, the intensity of emotions can be a concern for the teens um, and that, that sense of emotional regulation can be difficult for them because they just haven't developed yet to a point of being able to figure that out and find a way of coping with those emotions that are overwhelming. So the things we look for, of course, is isolation, um, depression, anxiety, any, any risky behaviors like substance abuse and things and of that sort. So some of what we will often talk about in groups is, of course, we'll talk about the loss, but also just always weave in that 
So what's next? Who, who are you in the midst of this? And how, how, how do you define yourself? And um, they often respond once they find a fit in group, they really respond to being in group with peers and knowing that they have a, they, they, they can really value that sense of community that they can have there. Um, so ultimately what we're, what we're hoping is that with this, the more stable, some caring adults and peers, that it gives them a sense of meaningful connection and providing a sense of being seen and being known in the midst of, of some pretty overwhelming experiences in their life. Uh, and often we will talk, you know, after, not initially, but after a while that the feelings they have won't necessarily feel this intense for as long as they do now um, and kind of help them to see that there's, that, there's a way out potentially. So, so that's that's a just a crash course speed through <laughs> development with um, kids and and grief. I was so. going to bring up too, Lisa. It applies to all ages, but that that clinginess factor that we sometimes see, um, particularly if it's a parent who's died. You know, we'll see with teens, even though they're kind of pulling away, or naturally they're they're pulling away from their family and developing independence. Um, there can be that real dependency on a surviving parent uh, because, you know, in some ways their safety net is now down to one caring adult. And for some kids, if, if both parents were supportive, um, uh, so we're really wrestling with that. And we see it with younger kids too, of course, that real clinginess. Parents talk about that quite often in our groups of just um, struggling to get space from their children. So that's our very real um, need that children have. And even thinking about COVID, you know, in some ways that the home has become such a huge part of the child's or the teen's life. Like they've clung to this home. Now they're supposed to go back out to schools and be involved in activities. And that can be a real challenge for them because um, they've, they've clung to this, this home base for many um, as kind of their safe spot. Right, and we talked about that a little bit before coming on today because of that was one of the questions um, that someone had put out into the webinar. and and looking at what their what their strengths were before um, COVID, what their strengths were before the loss, before the death, um, and helping them to see those strengths and um, find ways to get back to that. Yeah. So some of that routine. So, okay, we can put up the slide for family, family grief, Ashley. Right. So all of these kids and teens um, are functioning within a, a family, maybe the extended family that they're now living with, um, <coughs> how they, however they define family, but it, it's the, the family system is crucial to the experience of the individual um, and their experience of grief. Um, so the roles, the rules, the, the way communication is done in the family, the boundaries, kind of what is, what's responsible for what the family's responsible for and what is outside or external um what belongs to the environment and not to the family um how that's all understood and um and set out and followed um for a family that's grieving a significant loss is really important to how their how it will impact their grief journey one of the things that we talk about is that the experts say is that really the, the one of the really the key factor for children and teens in in exploring their own grief and finding their way way through grief is to have adults in their life who are willing to do the same. So it's that they're willing to have that that express their grief experience. Um, that it's not doesn't have to be a strength with their grief experience. It doesn't have to be a clear path through it. It can be really messy, which of course it usually is, but that they're willing to experience the grief for themselves and then find ways to mourn and find ways to cope. And that's really crucial then for the teens and the children in their life to see that example in the adults in their life. Um, so the keys to the family um, sense of resilience after the significant loss is their their belief system. So being able to find meaning in the midst of the adversity. Um, and again, it's how they define that is what's crucial. How the family is organized. So that ability to be flexible, connected, 
Um, if they're able to, when they don't, aren't operating that way, can they find their way back to that? Um, we often talk about that it's individuals will grieve within a family system, but they're in, but individuals have their own experience. So not everyone's going to have the same experience. Um, and then, then of course, how the family communicates. Is it clear, open, honest, willing to express the feelings and find ways to solve problems um, and find ways to accept how it might be different across the family members. So the next slide, um, this touches on, and there's a lot more here, of course, but the, the goal is that the family will find their way to make meaning um, it, amongst the, the, this huge loss in their life. And this is meaning making is some work that Robert Niemeyer has done. Um, he's out of Portland and he's a psychologist, I believe, but he's, he has a book and, and several writings on um, meaning making in families. And, and um, so what the family values, their family rituals, their traditions, um, what do they want to hold on to? What do they want to carry on after this loss? How they define spirituality? Um, if there's a religion that's important to them, how that plays in, into um, finding a sense of meaning. Um, storytelling is hugely important in that meaning making. Um, and families will often have to tell and retell the story. And, and a child's telling of the story may be very different than other members of the family and that we really accept that at Bridges as their way of processing and finding their understanding as an individual of this huge loss in their life. Um, so yeah, anything else you'd add? No, I think that's good. Yep. Yeah. So go ahead and go to the next slide there, Ashley, and we'll move through these pretty quickly, but ways we can help. Um, first off, to seek the family strength or even the child's strength if they're not part of a family that you know of, um, know of the family strength in general. Uh, but certainly some families, you know, there's just a general affection they have, uh, appreciation for each other. Their communication can be really good. Um, they maybe have gone through hard times in the past and managed stress and crisis even um, in the past. So it's important to recognize all those things that families maybe have experienced and and been through together. Um, but when it comes to children, you know, recognizing their strengths uh, look different, um, but things like drawing, like we talked about, reading, just being able to talk perhaps, uh, moving, sports can be really important for children as they go through loss. Um, I know a lot of people put a lot of emphasis on talking about their experience, which is important certainly, um, but there is a lot of research in terms of um, more the instrumental is what they call it, instrumental grieving, which is more doing. So doing something for your grief rather than just talking about it. For some people, the talking is most important and that's what they call intuitive. But for the instrumental folks, they may not thrive in a support group. They may get something still out of it, but um, it's also important for them to, to do something, whether that's play a sport in memory of the person, to make something, to do a fundraiser. Those are really important things as well. And you can see those even developing in children um, and certainly teens is um, some of those other ways that maybe aren't as common for um, ways to grieve. Secondly is hearing stories. And this one we could talk about for days because it's really important, but just recognizing it's so important for people to share their story and for that story to be really listened to. Um, I love the quote by Ili Wiesel. Some of you might know him as a Holocaust survivor and an author, but he said, uh, whoever survives a test or survives a loss, whatever it may be, must tell the story. That is his or her duty. And I think that's where we heal is oftentimes through those stories and feeling like people hear our stories. So giving children and teens and families a chance to do that. Uh, third, acknowledging the uncertainty that they live with, understanding that they're going through a huge change right now and trying to find some meaning out of that, like Lisa mentioned, which may not be something you're gonna say at the beginning, right when the loss has happened or even in that early few months, um, but knowing, just holding on to that thought of like, how would this child, this teen or this family uh, bring some meaning to even the, the worst things that may be happening uh, or have happened to them in their life. Let's see, uh, seeking their understanding of the death and their search for meaning. We talked a little bit about that right there. Um, recognizing movement and growth. Uh, movement is a really important word for us. Um, grief happens best when you see movement. Um, when people start to stagnate and be at the same spot all the time, 
that's a concern. Um, more than when people are just going through a really hard season, like if there's movement in that difficulty of the season, that's more hopeful than a, somebody who's just stays at the same spot the whole time. So movement and growth are really important. And then finally, encouraging them to accept the journey they're on. Knowing it's a journey, it's not a quick fix. And that can be really hard in our uh, instant gratification culture that we live in, uh, where we can get so much information and get our needs met in some ways and in really instant ways. Uh, but with grief, there isn't just something they can do that's gonna make the pain and the loss and the hurt go away. And so recognizing that it is a journey and things can get better, but it's not gonna be something that happens in three days of bereavement leave, like we often see with employers or even sometimes in a year, sometimes people put that year long timeline on their grief. And that can be really hard when they get to that one year and they still have hard days and they think they should be over whatever the loss is. And we just don't use thing, words like over, um, actually, I think that's gonna be the next slide, but um, recognizing it's a journey. Go ahead and go to the next slide there, Ashley. Um, so words and actions we avoid. Um, I won't go through all these for the sake of time, um, but uh, just a couple to highlight. Um, saying I know how you feel uh, is sometimes tempting, particularly when we've gone through our own loss and maybe it is a connection that we think we have with that person. Um, it's really important for everyone to feel like their grief journey is their grief journey and to know that even though there are similarities that they're hopefully gonna find with fellow grievers, um, saying you know exactly how you feel kind of shuts them down or can shut people down. Be like, oh, you already know exactly how I feel. What's the point in me telling you what my life is like right now or what I'm struggling with? Um, we oftentimes just wanna make ourselves feel better as listeners because we can be kind of uncomfortable when folks are going through such a hard time. So I mean, words like this, the person in the better place, um, I think sometimes can maybe make us feel better, but um, can, can be hard for the person that's grieving because it feels like, well, even if they were in a better place, it, that's not necessarily giving me much comfort right now. So, um, or even that you'll be stronger because of this. It's like, that might be true. And that might be the long-term, um, some of the meaning that can be coming, but to tell them that doesn't necessarily mean it's, you're gonna speak that into existence for them that that maybe makes us feel better um, knowing maybe what, what might, be on the horizon for them, but it's not going to make the griever necessarily feel better. So those are just a few things. We'll, we'll I think I would just yeah. really quick yeah. add that we try to avoid saying loved one, right. referring yeah. if there's a death of a person, um, referring to them as a loved one, because that's defining a value to that relationship that may stymie the person's ability to really talk about what that relationship was like. That isn't is often. Um, at times, not often, but it can at times be not very loving for them. For them. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and relationships are complicated. So grief is complicated too. I think it's unwise to think grief is not going to be have some complications. And I think the more people are willing to identify the whole relationship rather than just the good parts of it, probably the better off they'll be as they continue to grieve. Let's go to the next slide, Ashley. <clears throat> So just a few truths about grief and then we'll open it up for questions is uh, grief is a process as we've talked about and it's unique to the individual but it's influenced certainly by family that's a huge part of what influences our grief but also our community and our other social systems so we want to be aware of that as we look at children and teens and then the broader family and community that they're involved in um, grief challenges our identity our relationships our beliefs our view of the world and our role in it there's a lot that grief will challenge it's kind of like it's a puzzle that's kind of thrown up in the air it comes back down and you got to put all the pieces back together and it may look different than it did before the grief uh, the death happened or the loss happened we talked a little bit about death is not something you get over, uh, something you move through and certainly hope for healing and you hope for growth and movement, but it's never something that you'll get over. There'll probably always be a piece of your grief that um, pops up from time to time and that's to be expected. Uh, the goal of grief work is to gain an interest in life and to feel hopeful again. It's not to take away the pain altogether, but it is certainly to move through it and to gain an interest in life and to develop some elements of hope about my life moving forward. And then finally, it does not, does not matter how slowly you go, so long as you do not stop. Um, and I think that's really important. 
for all of us as we continue to live through the pandemic and some of the losses we've gone through, uh, but certainly encouraging um, as we work with folks who are going through loss is to recognize it's okay if you feel like you're going slowly as long as you continue to keep moving forward and not stop. So I believe that's our last slide, Ashley. So I, oh, and I'll, I'll read the quote for all of us. Um, this is from an author that actually Bridges is featured in uh, one of her writings. Rachel Naomi Remen is the author. The book that Bridges in is uh, My Grandfather's Blessing, uh, but she says this in one of her writings. Uh, the greatest blessing we offer others may be the belief we have in their struggle for freedom, the courage to support and accompany them as they determine for themselves the strength that will become their refuge and the foundation of their lives. So with that, I think we've got a few minutes for questions. So we can either take questions from the chat, from the Q&A, or if folks want to verbally say those questions, we're happy to answer. Thank you so much, Lisa and Darren. This is so helpful. And one of the things I appreciate the most about these webinars is they've been able to be scheduled in response to parents and caregivers asking for those resources and supports. And we know our kids have really been struggling during this pandemic and families have been struggling. And so it's so helpful to have these kind of resources and be able to support each other and having these conversations. So I really just appreciate both of you for sharing these resources with us today and everybody who participated. Um, there was also some great comments in the chat box as well. The Year of Magical Thinking was a, a recommended um, resource. And then another participant just uh, discussed that they work with middle school students and really recognizing the difference in developmental stages, even though they might be around the same age, the difference between mm -hmm. 11, 12, and 13 year old. And so I think it was really great to have that breakdown by those different stages as well and having those different ideas and resources. Um, there are any other questions or answers? I think um, one of the questions um, we'll probably have to follow up via email afterwards. Um, but maybe um, as we close, do you guys have any ideas to on how to address compounding factors around death and loss, um, around you know COVID restrictions or other things that may compound factors around grief and loss? Yeah, we were talking about that a little bit before because we saw that question. Um, you know, the COVID restrictions has certainly made it hard to have funerals, memorial services, celebration of lives. Um, that we're used to. I mean, certainly people have gotten creative with doing virtual things. Um, and I'm hopeful even for the virtual events that have happened, there may still be um, funerals, memorial service, celebration of lives that happened after the pandemic is over and after we're able to, to um, move back into a little more normalcy or at least gathering with more people. Uh, Cause I think those are really important. Um, I think sometimes people feel like that they need that for closure which closure is again, another one of those words that we try to stay away from. Um, but it does make it complicated. And I think we talked a little bit just about how grief doesn't end after a service. So recognizing you can always have a service, you can always do something, families can do something, you know, individual or, you know, as a family, things can be done individually. Recognizing those rituals are really important in grief work. And so um, continuing to encourage people to do, um, to have rituals or to think about what might be a meaningful ritual for them to continue. And moving forward. Um, and then the other part, I guess, is the, um, the multiple layers or certainly the, the losses that have a little more stigma to them. We talked a little bit about suicide, but homicide is certainly like that. Um, even um, if there's abuse, drug or alcohol abuse related to a, a, a death, that can be something that has to be um, acknowledged and worked through. Um, there's also, yeah, there's also the trauma piece too, actually, you know, for kids and teens that have witnessed something, trauma is different than grief. And so I think it's important to recognize that trauma needs usually more of a one-on-one -on -one type of experience to process the trauma before the grief can really be addressed. Or sometimes you can get at it <clears throat> in two different types of settings like individual and group work. Um, but trauma in solely group work can be really a difficult position to put children, teens or adults in and trying to do work when they just have that traumatic event of what they've witnessed. So being careful of acknowledging the difference there when there's trauma. I don't know if there's anything down. No, no, I think that's good. Thank I was you. I was thinking about the the question in there about that you have in the chat about preparing toddler for the passing of an adult mm -hmm. and then that being the stable adult in the um, 
in the family for that child. And um, multiple conversations, repeated conversations about about what's going on in the family as much as it, it makes sense for that child to hear. We often talk about letting the child lead some of that as far as really seeing what's coming up for them. So that to be a guide for what that child is concerned about and what they need. But simultaneously uh, creating a, a plan of, of who can care for that child in the event that the parent um, dies. And so that when that, that child, I, you know, when you say toddler, they're likely not ready to hear that. But when they are, hopefully at an age where they can have some understanding of that, then they can see um, what, the, the, what the plan is. Um, but multiple conversations around it, seeing what the child's coming up with and then creating a plan to um, support the child, so. Thank you so much. And it looks like we are right at the four o'clock mark. So I wanna thank Lisa and Darren again for sharing your wealth of expertise and resources. I know you both shared your information. I did put a copy of uh, the PowerPoint in the chat, but I will also attach it to the Kids Mental Health Pierce County website as well as send that out via email. So again, thank you all for participating today. We will continue our web, uh, webinar series next month where we'll be doing an overview of Tacoma General's Adolescent Behavioral Health Unit as well as children's long-term inpatient. So again, Lisa and Darren, thank you so much for your wealth of knowledge, expertise and resources. And thank you to everyone who participated in today's webinar. And we hope to connect with you soon. So for more information and other resources, please visit our website. It's kidsmentalhealthpiercecounty.org and enjoy the rest of your day.